Now it's time for the final part of the series, Trumpton Riots, a nostalgic look at children's television. Fred Harris visits the small world of Pugwash, Windy and Barney McGrew. Who was Captain Pugwash's arch-enemy? Who lived in Festive Road? And finally, complete this well-known list. Pew, pew, Barney McGrew, Cuthbert, Dibble. Well, how'd you get on? If you're not sure, the answers will come over the next 20 minutes or so. If, on the other hand, you've got the lot, well, I'm afraid there's no hope for you. Like me, you're a total animation anorak, a tot's television train spotter. Why is it that so many of those early television animations have become cults? To get a clear, definitive answer, we need an expert or two. Somebody erudite, rational, articulate. Hi, Doc. Hi, Doc. Hi, Doc. Hi, Doc. Bawa. Bawa. The voice of those evergreen superstars, and literally dozens of others since, is my personal hero, Peter Hawkins. I asked him to pop in. Whose idea was it to do goon show voices? Was that your idea? I suppose it was. The, the, the brief was that they wanted something quite different and they wanted a different language and uh, after a very short time I came up with the what is known to a lot of people as oddle poddle. Now I, I've always wanted to know this, yeah. when the scripts were actually put put in front of you, yeah. did they say schlob up weed or did they have English words which you had to translate? They were always English words which uh, the, the woman who narrated it always said before I said the, the lines so they're always there and I always translated them on the page into whatever I thought should Give be Give me said. an example. Um, the Queen was always called um, Your Majesty in the script, and I always said, Oh, I do model stuff. <laughs> <laughs> overcome, usually, very overcome. <laughs> and bowing very low. <laughs> of course, one of the big problems with animation has always been the cost. You can't do Disney-style animation on a Mickey Mouse budget. I was pondering the irony of that when, as if by magic... A man appeared, David McKee, who once dreamed up this innocuous young chap who had a bit of a clothes fixation. It came about through books first. Uh, I was cartooning for the press at the time and wanted to do a story about a man in a, re in a, well, a red knight, a man in a suit of armour, and worked out the way to get an ordinary man into that suit of armour. I would no idea about it, uh, writing a series, and but it seemed a natural once I got him through that shop into another adventure, another life, via the, the costume, to go on and try another costume. I set him in the street which I, which I lived in. Which I've was done a bit of research. Called uh -huh. Festing Road in Putney, was it not? That's ah. very good research, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And eventually you called it Festive Road. Called it, yeah. Festing sounds too much like festering, you know. And, uh, yeah, but, but Festive is uh, obviously quite a nice name for a street. And in fact, uh, the people that I used in the street were people that were living in the street at the time. I had my own family in um, outside the house. I actually put, I lived in 54, and I put Mr. Ben in number 52, uh, so that he was my neighbour. But um, we thought about putting a blue plaque up, but we couldn't decide which house to put it on. <laughs> did you ever appear? I did in the book, actually. I peep from behind a curtain. The animation itself was very simple. Mm. Where, wherever possible, you don't see the legs moving. And when you do see them moving, they sort of jump back and forwards in a kind of panic, stiff-legged. Why was that? That's the way I walk, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> no, um... That's, uh, that's because I didn't know how to do any animation. I'd never made films before. I knew nothing about making films. And also there was a budget limit which meant very cheap uh, animation. And it was easier to work with uh, detailed drawings and a lot of camera movement, which is what we did. Were you aware at the time that you were making something that was going to last for 20 years plus? No, I suppose when you make anything you hope that it's going to last. They're a bit like children in a way. That when, after they're born, you... You, you help them all you can, but they go off and do things and, and you stand back and, and sort of say, Oh, is that my son or is that my daughter? 
When he went to get his front door key out, he found an unusual box of matches in his pocket. I'll keep them carefully, just to remind me. At the end of it, you always told the kids, ah, oh, yes, this was real, because he always had a little souvenir. That's he? right. Yeah, the souvenirs were quite interesting, I thought. That, as you say, that brought the reality, that brought the story to always be there, you know. It uh, wasn't so all this, a druggy uh, trip, was it, all these uh, adventures people asked into? this, yeah, maybe. It was that period, you know. How important was the music in that programme? Oh, I think that was very important. People have often commented on it. I think at one time the I think it was the Northern Ballet or one of the one of the orchestras tuned up with the theme tune did dum 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 da da do dee do dee do of uh, of Mr. Ben. Of course, Mr. Ben was the ultimate Mr. Nice Guy. So, is that the secret for a TV cult hero? Well, no. Some cult figures were out-and-out -out rotters. John Ryan was the artist who created Pugwash and his dastardly crew. It started in 1950 when I got married. And a friend of mine who was broke, as indeed we all were, said, I can't give you a wedding present, but I can give you a useful introduction. This was to uh, a very strange parson called the Reverend Marcus Morris, who was in the process of starting a magazine called Eagle. He said, if you do something really funny, I will publish it. So I went away, I started drawing, and the captain appeared on my paper, and that is all I can tell you. I remember he was just there, and... Uh, much thinner than he is now. And Marcus Morris did indeed publish him, and he appeared in the first 12 numbers of Eagle. But the captain, uh, having been born, he refused to die. Shattering sharks! I can hardly wait to get ashore. Now, you, you weren't afraid in Pugwash to have goodies and baddies. Now, some of the animators, for example, if you think of Camberwick Green, there were no baddies there. In my imagination, uh, it's a wicked world, and... Within reason, I think children should be aware the, <laughs> aware of this. Cutthroat Jake is about as evil as I as I reckoned I could make him, bearing in mind that I'm working for very small children. I used to have a little bit of trouble with the BBC ladies sometimes. Um, you have to be very careful that Tom the cabin boy doesn't allow anything too wicked to succeed. You know, there's always had to strike a certain sort of balance. <laughs> We'll give him something to do and all. <laughs> After him, boys! <laughs> How important do you think was the music as a key to the success of Pugwash? I think the music was enormously important. This little tune was plucked out of the BBC archives by Gordon Murray all those years ago. A few years ago, the British folk music society got in touch with me and said they were doing an article about the Pugwash theme. Now, all I knew about it was that it had been played by a gentleman in Northumberland, Tom Edmondson, um, on a squeeze box in 1952. Uh, I'd always assumed that Tom was long since dead. I thought of him as a funny old man who'd done this sort of almost in his last dying breath. So I was astonished when the folk music people said, we've talked to Tom Edmondson about this. And I then got in touch with him, and I discovered that he had been paid five pounds by the BBC for that tune. Never had a penny since. He's a lovely man. He's a grave digger. But Tom is still very much alive, and I've been to see him. We had tea together. We had a great time. Blundering purposes, Master Mate. What matter if it... Help! And the voice of them all, Peter Hawkins again. I had to decide on voices that had a lot of separation because when you're going at that rate you've got to have something that is easily recognised straight away. So Barnabas used to be like that, you know, he was a horrible great creature. Uh, the bait talked through his nose, you know, he had a sort of nasal, nasal voice. I like the bait very much. Captain, he always called him Captain. <laughs> <laughs> um, Willie had a, a high north country voice. <laughs> Oh, yes. And uh, who else was there? Well, that was Pugwash himself. 
Well, pug, pug, pugwash, yes, he had a very nasal voice. I don't know where I got that from. Uh, out of the blue, I think. <laughs> Beyond the blue. No, he didn't sing very often. Shh! Silence, master mate. But, but I didn't utter nothing, Captain. Oh, dear. Very peculiar. Let me ask you about some of the names of the characters because uh, there's a there's a bit of a myth going round. I don't know if it's a myth. Or I don't know if it's true. I remember Master Mate. Mm -hmm. Now that with the rather nasal voice that Peter used for the captain came out very much like Master Bate. Were these other characters? Did they really no, exist? No, they never existed. Because what have we heard of? There's Seaman yeah, Staines. Seaman Staines and Roger the Cabin Boy, and I haven't heard of any others. I write and um, make films for children and I think this started with some second-rate TV comic, I can't remember who it was now, um, about ten years ago. Now, whether that's done me more harm than good, I just don't know. I mean, it might have been one of the things that kept the captain in the public eye. <laughs> One very creative children's producer, Michael Cole, realised you don't need animated graphics to create a cult. You don't even need expensive puppets. All you need is some paper, scissors and a helping hand. Yuffie lifts a finger And a mouse is there Puts his hands together And a seagull takes the air Yuffie lifts a finger And a scampy darts about Yuffie bends another, and a tortoise head peeps out. We had a sort of shed at the end of our cottage, which I'd put up really so my son might start to, to do some woodwork. And it was really hot, and I used to go in this shed for hours trying to think up what it turned into finger bobs without any luck. And as I did, I, I found myself sort of gesticulating to try and get an idea out of the air. And I think probably I noticed I was using my hands a lot. And finger bobs is very much to do with the hands. And that's why the simplicity of everything in finger bobs... I mean, it was a belief, really, that the BBC had in those days of, of that children should be, possibly be able to make their own amusements and toys. These hands were made for making, and making they must do. Basically, I think it was to try and bring the, the four elements in, air, earth... Um, and water. So you had Flash, the tortoise on Earth, Gulliver the gull, and Scampy the prawn in water. I don't know what the fire one was. Probably weren't allowed to do a fire one. <laughs> I like to rise and spread my wings White upon the breeze I like to soar and spread my wings now, of course, Rick, Rick Jones was the guy who hosted it, but you gave him another name. Was it Yuffie or Yoffy? It was Yoffy. Why? Now, because the kids knew him already as Rick Jones from play school, didn't they? Well, yeah, but it, the original idea was that Rick wouldn't appear as himself. And in the first ones we made, he had a mask, a big oval face, a sort of cherubic, old, kind gentleman. And then, early on in, in my days at the Beeb, I went to Israel... And it was while I was in Israel, I kept hearing this wonderful word that they used, which is what we call great. What we, we would say great, they said yoffi. It's yoffi. It's lovely. It's yoffi. And it had the sort of lightness of what I wanted, really. And that's how he became yoffi. Now, Rick, uh, of course, you, you say he had a cherubic mask, but he was anything but a cherub, I'm told. <laughs> yes, yes. No, he, I mean, he was wonderful because he, he, he played with the camera. He teased the camera, he teased the child. And there were times when he didn't know his lines, but he could always get away with it. And there'd be a little twinkle or an eyebrow would go up. And his sense of timing was very mischievous. It was just when you thought he might have not coming up with something, he did. And it was, it was a wonderful rapport, I think, with the child, because he was completely natural. Finger mouse, finger mouse, the never stop. Think a mouse, the always on the brink a mouse, finger mouse. That's me. Uh, Fingerbolt was filmed in a little studio in Neil's yard, so it's very much really, although it's 1971, it, it, it's, it's very much the 60s. And um, 
the studio was behind or was part in the same building as I think it was Chrysalis Records, who had just produced a lot of the Monty Python records. So there was a feeling of Monty Python and all that at that time. Things like the Yellow Submarine it changed changed people's awareness, maybe. And so there was that surreal quality. And Rick was just marvellous because it was very, very hot and he would just sit there with his finger up. <laughs> Pardon the, <laughs> <laughs> the phrase. <laughs> with his mouse on the end. Finger mouse, finger mouse. I'm a sort of wonder mouse. A hit, a miss, a blunder mouse. Finger mouse. That's me. Whoa. Gordon Murray created not just one character, but a whole village full, and eventually a whole shire full. Here is the clock, the Trumpton clock, telling the time steadily, sensibly, never too quickly, never too slowly, telling the time for Trumpton. Whereabouts is Trumptonshire? Is it, uh, is it Kent or Sussex? No, there, there, there are mountains. There are mountains in the background, so I would think it's probably... In, 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 the, uh, in the middle of the country somewhere <laughs> because the mountains look rather nice in the background Which were your favourite characters? I didn't really have any favourite characters except that Windy Miller sort of developed, you know. And it was only coming in and out of that windmill that did it, because he never got hit by the sails. Uh, and that seemed to amuse people. Oh, I always assumed he had got hit, but you just didn't show us those shots. No, no, it was, it was just second nature that he never got hit by the sails. Trumpton Fire Station. Captain Flack here. A what? A dangerous chimney? Yes, of course we can, Mr. Troop. Right away, right away. The rhyme that everybody remembers is the pew, pew, Barney McGrew, Cuthbert, Dibble and Grub. Where did that come from? Um, well, it was just the rhythm. That was the bi big bit of choreography that I did. Influenced by my wife, who was a ballet dancer, you see. Uh, Pew and Pew are twins, you must understand. Uh, not Hugh Pew. I've seen it misrepresented yes, in the press yes, many times. Uh, I have explained until I'm blue in the face. Barney McGrew is the only one with his Christian and surname. The driver, the sleepy driver. Uh, Cuthbert, Dibble and Grub are uh, added ones to make the rhythm, I think. I can't oh, remember the instant. names. Did you have to play around with names until you got, got to that little formula? I very often use the phone book for names, which is very useful. I've got a complaint to make about Barney McGrew. Everybody else turned their head as their name was spoken, and Barney McGrew, lazy sod, didn't. Why? Well, he's always been a bit fed up with the whole thing, really. He only does it for the money. <laughs> pew, pew, Barney McGrew, Cuthbert, Dibble, Grub. <laughs> Brian Kant is Brian Kant. And I thought, well, that young man, because we were all that much younger at the time, <laughs> had the right sort of tone as a young father really. And he did terribly well. He was terribly good in the recording studio because he was good. Uh, and uh, he always took his sho shoes off before recording so that there wouldn't be any um, extraneous effects. Cuthbert, Dibble, Grub. What became of all those wonderful puppets and the models and everything? What happened to them? I burnt them. You didn't? In a bonfire in my garden. Uh, I'd had them some time after the transmissions had stopped. And various people said, oh, well, they're old-fashioned. And they always were old-fashioned, actually. They were old-fashioned from the word go. Uh, and I, uh, they'd, they'd been used an awful lot, you know. So I burnt them. 
together with the scenery. But how did that feel, seeing them all going up in flames? A puppet is an actor, you see. And as an actor, he only exists as he is performing. After that, uh, he's done his job, and therefore the actual figure is redundant. There's no crime, you know, in Trumptonshire. It's a happy world. And a lot of people say, well, you shouldn't encourage children to think that the world's like that. Um, some people throw their children into the deep end of the swimming bath at an early age and say, swim. You know, that's the way to learn life's hard, hard things that are coming to you. Uh, I don't believe in that. I believe that you must protect your children while they're children for as long as possible from this dreadful world we're living in. <laughs> So what's the secret of creating a cult TV children's programme? What have all those shows got in common? Well, not a lot, really. You don't have baddies, or you do. You have outrageous character voices, or you don't. You inject a bit of 60s surrealism, or you keep it simple and old-fashioned. So what is the secret? Well, in fact, there is one factor that all those shows have in common, along with the, the herbs, the wooden tops, the magic roundabout, Thunderbirds, and all the others... The people involved cared. They knew that it mattered. Why does it matter? Well, Gordon Murray puts it better than I ever could. Goodbye. I am very upset, because I'm an old man now, at the short length of childhood that children have. They don't have childhood for long. And I think that's a wicked shame, because childhood is the most marvellous thing you've got to remember for the rest of your life. Fred Harris presented Pugwash, Windy and Barney McGrew. The programme was produced by Laura Druce.